Okay, great. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, welcome everyone from wherever you're joining uh, to this webinar, uh, where we're going to be presenting the results of recent research from um, the Partnership for Gender Equity, but uh, that was um, conducted by a team of researchers at Yale University. A number of you on this call have spoken, ended up speaking to the team. Uh, and so we're thankful for those of you that did participate in the research. So I want to um, just quickly highlight who are our panelists here this morning. We'll be hearing more from them uh, as we move through the webinar. Uh, so just my name is Kimberly Eason. I am the founder and the CEO of the Partnership for Gender Equity. We've existed for, for more than five years now. Uh, and we were founded underneath the umbrella of the Coffee Quality Institute. My colleague, Greg Minahan, also joins us here this morning and he will be um, engaged throughout the conversation today. We have Nora Berkey, who many of you know, she's been a longtime friend and ally of the Partnership for Gender Equity. She served as our liaison with the Yale student research team. Uh, so she will be presenting the, the meat of the, the findings uh, today. And then we have Pam Schreier from Ecom, and uh, Pam is based in London and is part of our Gender Equity Index industry team. And of course, uh, as many of you know, a global company that provides services to farmers around the world and uh, will be a, a user of our Gender Equity Index. So just quickly, here is what we're gonna do in our next 40, 50 minutes. Um, so welcome. We want to share kind of why did we decide to, uh, to do this, to conduct this research. Tell you a little bit first about the Gender Equity Index so you can understand um, where we're headed as the Partnership for Gender Equity. Nora is going to present the research results. Um, we will invite um, Pam uh, to speak. Greg will engage Pam in a little bit of a conversation that you all will be a party to. And then uh, we'll give a status update as to what we're looking at doing, doing next uh, with the Gender Equity Index. And please, as you know, you've participated in many, many Zoom webinars over the past uh, year plus and more. Please do put your questions in the Q&A and uh, we will answer those as we get towards the end of the session. So thanks again for joining us. So, First, uh, just to really thank our collaborators in this research, the Yale Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, Women Forward International was actually the funder of the research along with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. And so this work would not have been possible without the support of these three organizations. Gender in agriculture is an incredibly complex topic. I think um, many of you are aware of this. And one of the things that we see as the Partnership for Gender Equity in our role is really to, to distill down the complexity of, complexities of gender in agriculture and make it possible for actors along the coffee and cocoa supply chains to take meaningful action. And so we, we like to kind of share this graphic, which um, came from one of the many studies that we use uh, to inform our, our programs, that um, gender is complex. And really mostly what we're doing in the coffee sector is focusing on access to productive resources and training and extension work. And you see all of these many other aspects that are also critically important, but potentially fall outside of the sphere of responsibility of the, the sector directly, but certainly are places where we want to have an influence. So with the Partnership for Gender Equity, uh, the tools and the programs that we're creating really are helping to get everyone in the coffee and cocoa sectors on a credible gender equity journey that we can put uh, out our vision for, for gender equity globally and be on a journey to reach that vision together. One of the tools is the Gender Equity Index. So quickly, I wanna tell you what that's about so you can be thinking uh, as you're hearing about the research findings, how we, how we can apply the research findings into meaningful action within the sector. So the Gender Equity Index is a diagnostic tool for extension and advisory service providers. And I'll tell you in a minute who we mean when we talk about EAS providers. The idea is that um, 
service providers want to know how they're doing with regards to gender equity action so that they can take action. Also, roasters and chocolate brands are interested in making sure that investments that they make are, are reaching women uh, and benefiting women and empowering women over time. So by having the gender equity index, we can start to create a shared language of gender equity that helps facilitate conversations along the supply chain and empowers all of us as stakeholders within the global coffee and cocoa sectors to talk about gender equity in meaningful ways and take action in meaningful ways and then measure and communicate about what we're doing with regard to gender equity. So the idea with the index is to embed gender equity in technical support programs uh, that, that service providers on the ground are providing, whether that be good agricultural practices training, financial literacy training, quality assurance, market connections, and more. And with the Gender Equity Index, we're really looking to drive change globally in a measurable and meaningful way that has impact for farming women, their families, and communities. So quickly, so we're all on the same page. What is an EAS provider? You'll, you'll be hearing that term EAS. An EAS provider is an extension and advisory service provider. And that can be public sector, could be private, could be civil society organizations or other institutions that are working on the ground to provide guidance and assistance to farmers and farmer organizations, providing them with uh, different investments and inputs and, um, and tools so that they, that they can leverage to improve how they um, work with regards to sustainable production and improve their income from agriculture. So I wanna highlight our phase one partners for the Gender Equity Index. You see uh, the companies here. These companies have not only provided financial uh, assistance uh, and support for this effort, but we've also been meeting. They have delegated the time of at least one person per organization to work with us to provide input and uh, ideas into the design of this Gender Equity Index. So we're very thankful to all of our partners. So what does the GEI solve? One of the things that we know is there's a lot of money going into sustainability programming on the ground. Just in coffee, it's more than $500 million per year. So if we have uh, add in cocoa and even um, investments that are not actually quantified in this number, it's a much greater number. We also are aware that this vital training resource is not necessarily reaching women and sometimes can even exacerbate gender inequalities on the ground unintentionally. And if these investments are not reaching women, it effectively diminishes their input, their agency, their effectiveness, and their power. We know that sustainability requires gender equity uh, and that unintentionally, there, there are um, ways that programming can, can exacerbate gender inequality or at the very least fail to exploit the opportunities that um, increase equity in the sector. This is a lot of text for a slide, but I just wanna show you that um, the idea behind the GEI process is that coffee roasters and chocolate brands, as you know, they have a significant voice in terms of uh, how they invest and how they buy coffee or cocoa. And so the voice of the roaster and the brands can be very useful in terms of driving change on the ground and throughout the, the supply chains. So the idea is that the roasters and the, and the um, brands are requesting and supporting that their supply chain partners engage with the gender equity index. The service providers take the online assessment uh, and that really sets a baseline for their, um, their performance on gender equity. Our role is to help support those service providers to get on a cred credible gender equity journey using the outputs from the GEI diagnostic tool and also work alongside of service providers to um, support them to be successful on that gender equity journey. We're all about helping to drive success for people and companies that are interested in uh, embedding gender equity in their work on the ground. Not only will PGE be providing services and support, but we also wanna connect the dots with other organizations, both at the very local level, the regional level, 
and the global level that, uh, that have gender expertise that can really be partners in this work to drive change. Roasters and brands also have the opportunity to invest in the work of the service providers and uh, incentivize that work. And then finally, we want to make sure that everyone is reporting on their gender equity journey, uh, taking stock annually of their progress and being able to really demonstrate their commitment and, and report their progress over time. So, uh, you know, I want to uh, thank, you know, Greg Minahan, who's been my partner in thinking through this opportunity of the Gender Equity Index. And we've had dozens of conversations over the past year with service providers, with roasters, with, with chocolate brands. And what we heard, we had this anecdotal evidence of, yeah, this is an issue. This is, there's a gap in terms of the understanding and awareness of the importance of gender equity well, sorry, there's not, there, there, there is a, we're closing the gap on the, um, the awareness and understanding of the importance of gender equity. It is getting uh, recognized as a key priority for sustainability, but the, the industry and the key actors really don't know how, how to, act, how to reach women. And so often the services don't reach women. They're not necessarily designed and implementing considering the constraints, needs, or concerns of women. And they're not really able to be measured in a way that uh, is, is able to be then communicated the, the impact or the, um, um, or the progress. And so as the Partnership for Gender Equity, we had a sense that we were on the right track, but we really wanted um, a, a much clearer picture uh, to understand what, what's our starting point with the Gender Equity Index. So you'll hear today, uh, Nora, I'm gonna turn over to Nora in just a moment. You'll hear today the findings uh, from the Yale research team in conversation, uh, desk research and in conversation with a number of actors across the coffee and cocoa sectors. And what we wanted to do today was to present the findings linked to the key domains of the gender equity index. So these are the domains in terms of what is important with service delivery on the ground um, for EAS providers. So organizational capacity, design of programs and services, delivery of training and technical assistance, context and alliances, and continuous improvement. And so these domains have been informed uh, by our, our own work as PGE, but also from the industry group that I mentioned earlier, from our, uh, our supporters for phase one, and a panel of gender experts who is also working uh, in this process with the GEI to make sure that we're really taking into account the, the, the um, significant gender expertise that exists um, on gender and agriculture. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Nora and um, have her tell you a little bit about the, the process and some of the key findings. So thanks, um, Nora, for, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I, I really feel that I had one of the most exciting uh, roles in this work, which was to support the four brilliant students from Yale to conduct this research. And so just want to thank them and, and name them up front. Um, Abby Cohen, Robin Schmid, uh, Maya St. Germain, and Deanna Johnson. Um, so over the, it, throughout the beginning of this year and over the course of about three months, the Yale team both designed the research approach and then carried it out. So they started with conducting desk research um, of basically looking at available public information from 22 public, private, and uh, nonprofit uh, extension and advisory service providers, AES providers, and then they followed up with interviews uh, designed around to, to find out things that they weren't able to, to ascertain from the desk research. So um, if you can go to the next slide. So within the report, you'll find the, the findings around their desk research in particular, but what was most interesting for us was the findings from the interviews, because within you know websites and and kind of available public information, you know we're not always getting to the details of of how projects are carried out in design. We more see maybe the end result, um, and sometimes you know websites don't get updated very often. So this was really the the heart of the research was was the findings from the interviews. 
So um, going back to the five domains that Kimberly mentioned, we'll kind of discuss four findings around four in detail today. So we, we're kind of teasing these and then leaving more information about one. But the way that the students designed the question was basically trying to understand from EAS providers just generally their, their understanding or their approach to gender equity around each domain. So the first one being organizational capacity, they designed questions to ask just, you know, how would EAS providers describe their internal capacity um, around gender and gender responsive programs? And then kind of what do they think demonstrated that? You know, we all have a different understanding of maybe how robust our our sustainability work is and our gender work in particular. So rather than telling people, you know, up front what their what their work looked like to us, we wanted to hear, you know, what how did they feel about their internal capacity and what did they think demonstrated that? So for the findings, some of the findings on this, the students found that there really was across the board a lack of a separate area of focus or independent strategy for gender equity and gender integration. And um, if there was a, a focus, it might have been kind of one particular focus of a part of a broader sustainability strategy, but that might that focus might not have reached all aspects of their work and their service provision. So the suggestion is that perhaps gender is still not viewed as a fundamental priority for many providers, but is kind of just a small part that you might have to check off in, in the broader you know, sustainability conversation. And we'll talk more about these findings as we, as we go through. And so in particular, we, for the second domain, wanted to know more about how ES providers were designing their programs and their services and how they consider gender equity into all of their programs and services, how they analyzed their, their consideration of gender to make sure it was more robust or could be continually incorporated into new regions or projects. Um, and then really kind of how, how important it is, you know, how important AS providers thought this approach was for all of their projects and regions. And then again, more about their internal capacity, not just internal capacity you know, to, to consider gender more broadly, but also their internal capacity to build gender into all their programs throughout all their projects and, and regions. So one of the uh, most important findings was about a lack of consistent gender mainstreaming efforts. And so by that, we mean, and the students meant that gender was, was not considered in all projects and activities. So there was often gender was considered as maybe a standalone effort for a particular project in a particular region. And that was supposed to sort of demonstrate a, a broader focus or a broader commitment to gender equity. But when we looked at you know, all of the programs and projects and services that are being provided, gender was not considered equally um, or at all in sometimes in, in all of those projects and activities and in all regions of work. So this was a very interesting finding for, for us that gender equity strategies had largely been implemented as a reaction to the demands of consumers in a market. So that's good and bad, right? Because if, if EAS providers are responding to consumer demands, um, that means they're, they're doing kind of part of their job well. They are listening to the market. And it also shows that, that consumers can have an impact and, and conscious consumerism is important. And it is important when, when clients, um, and does have an impact when clients do ask for a greater focus on gender equity. So that's positive. But the, um, the area for opportunity and growth and improvement comes from the fact that that, that is a reactive approach. Um, and it's meant that in order to, to respond to a consumer or a client, then an, an organization, an EIS provider might have created kind of very one-off ad hoc gender programming um, to, to kind of fill that gap you know, more immediately. And so, especially if a client was only maybe uh, sourcing coffee or working with farmers from a certain area, then the gender program would have been, would have been focused there and not kind of broadly throughout the, the broader organization. Next slide. And this connects to the inability um, that the students found through their research to of, of many AS providers to conduct comprehensive gender analyses before beginning project implementation. Um, so whether this was due to a lack of funding or a lack of know-how or a combination of both, lack of time, um, there wasn't always this comprehensive gender analysis before beginning project implementation. So um, that also contributed to kind of more ad hoc programming 
where one gender program would have been developed in response to, to a market need, um, but it wouldn't necessarily have all, even been designed based on a comprehensive gender analysis to get the full, the full picture. Um, so being able to conduct these analyses would both uh, improve gender mainstreaming across more regions and projects, as well as the overall impact and outcome of that project. So this was a, a huge need that was found through the research. Great. So moving on to the next domain, which is delivery of training and technical assistance. The, the students were focused on asking EAS providers through interviews how they uh, ensured that their trainings were gender inclusive and how they addressed disparities in, in women's participation. Of course, uh, the providers don't have rules that say, you know, only men can join this training or women can't join this training. But of course, women's participation uh, and the reasons they might be joining or not, you know, comes from a lot of other, other things, such as maybe lack of time or um, location challenges. So the students wanted to know how these considerations were analyzed um, and incorporated when it came to trainings and making sure that services reached women and how much those considerations were equal, um, equally considered across projects and regions. So they found that there was an inconsistent implementation of gender programming, again, kind of by region, but um, this led to, or was in part caused by inconsistent definitions of gender equity and inclusion. So, um, you know, that meant that, you know, for example, within a training or um, within a particular service, you know, throughout different regions, there were different goals, perhaps, or understanding of what gender equity would have looked like in that training setting, or what gender equ equity would have looked like, you know, for that service provision. So this kind of lack of sharing across regions, which, again, is, you know, in part due to the ad hoc programming, where, you know, maybe a program is being developed in one region, but there's not this focus on mainstreaming um, throughout the entire organization, throughout the entire projects. As a result of that, there was an inconsistent understanding between staff across regions, um, inconsistent goals across regions, and kind of all of this led to inconsistent uh, implementation of programming. And then also just a, a lack of understanding of what one staff member's individual responsibility might be uh, to support gender efforts. And, and I just want to jump in here a little bit, Nora, and, and add on that, on that last point. You know, the, the inconsistent definitions um, sort of might lead you to think that people have the incorrect definitions, and, and that's not really what we found. What we found is that uh, there are several, as we saw in that opening slide that Kimberly showed, there, there are several aspects of gender equity, and what we're seeing is that you can, you can define gender equity as market access, for instance, and women's coffee. You can define uh, gender equity as access to finance. You can, um, you can define it as, as entrepreneurial support for, for women in small and growing businesses. Um, and, and so what we're looking here is that people come to the table with a slice of the pie and not the whole pie. And so are sort of missing a, a more holistic uh, vision of gender equity. Great, thank you. Really good, really important point to add. Great. So yes, we've skipped uh, number four, which uh, domain four, which is, uh, so we encourage you to read the report and, and find out more of the findings for yourself. Um, but we will skip now to the last domain, which is about continuous improvement and measurement. So the students asked the providers how they measured their efforts toward gender equity. So essentially, how did they know what they know and, and what, they're, what they were telling us? And what were the outcomes that they were evaluating? Uh, they also asked whether gender disaggregated data was only collected from certain projects uh, and versus all projects and what the challenges you know, were in, in people faced in collecting this data. And then, of course, we were looking for opportunities for, for improving um, programming through data collection and improving measurement as well. So the good news is that um, EIS providers did recognize the importance of data collection you know, in general and impact evaluation in general for, for sustainability work and gender inclusive programming in particular. Um, but they did report an inability to enact a robust system that across the board was able to, to capture gender uh, disaggregated data for kind of all their, all their programs. And they, they lacked a system for specific indicators that were related to gender. So 
Oh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't think this had switched. Great, so um, the S providers, they, they also uh, talked about an inability to measure impact in the mid or long term on gender outcomes. And I think this relates in part to their recognition that gender, you know, doesn't, it, gender equity improvement and, um, you know, changes in, in uh, individual responsibility or behavior, it doesn't change overnight. So there was, a, and there is a need to have not only short-term measures, but also mid or long-term measures um, and so that was a, a challenge to figure out how to, to measure across time in that way, but as well as across kind of different levels of, of value chain. So at an individual level and community level and market level, there's, you know, when it comes to gender equity, it's, you know, it's about relationships. There's changes at an individual level, uh, personally within families, within the community, within market relationships and, you know, different market actors prioritizing gender in different ways. So there's, there's so much that can be measured, um, you know, across different levels, across time, and that can contribute to a continuous learning and evaluation. Um, but, but it was a real challenge to figure out, you know, how, how to do this, uh, especially across, you know, regions where things are different or across projects where maybe the focus of the project is different. So um, there's, there's an opportunity for, you know, a third party to support with this. But the good news is that most EAS providers, or I'd say all, you know, did understand the importance of prioritizing smallholder women farmers um, in all of their interventions. Great. Um, and so right now, by and large, most providers were measuring attendance specifically at training. So that was that was a good thing. Um, but when it came to other more specific indicators, they were mostly only uh, used when as part of specific gender projects. So not only you know did gender was it mostly considered as a part of a specific ad hoc project, but then that was mostly when gender more specific gender indicators and more robust gender indicators were being used. So there's definitely an opportunity to take that learning and those indicators from specific projects and mainstream them throughout uh, more parts of the organization. Great. So those were some of the some of the findings around the domains and the questions that were asked in the interview phase. And um, as I mentioned in the beginning, there was a desk review page. So as you go through this report, you'll see a lot more information. Um, but the way we ended the report was talking about best practices and lessons learned. So the or the practices that were the best that the partners and AS providers identified that they were acting upon, as well as some of the lessons they had learned. So this was one of my favorites. I think it's really important is that uh, EAS providers mentioned that partnerships within the sector with capable organizations really was the best way and the most likely way that gender work was going to be implemented. So I think my perspective sometimes is the at least coffee industry and, and perhaps cocoa as well. It's a very DIY industry, sort of a do-it-yourself do mentality uh, in, some, in some parts. Um, but the providers noted that building partnerships with other organizations was the best way to do to do this work. So I wanted to highlight that in particular. And then engaging meaningfully with the community was another good practice. And many organizations did consult directly with community members, especially women, ensuring that in the design of their programs, community members had a voice and, and were able to make decisions and, and, and take part in program creation. Uh, and then other good practices was then working with those community members so they can function as leaders and role models for others in the community. And then ensuring that uh, trainings and, and programming are access accessible to women. There were a lot of organizations um, that were doing this in particular related to the fact that they were measuring women's attendance and gender equitable attendance at trainings. Um, has allowed them to ensure that these trainings are accessible. And so that included some practices around that, included scheduling trainings during times that were um, relevant to women's schedules, uh, offering childcare, for example, and then of course, developing the targets to make sure that, that those changes that they were implementing had, had an impact and were getting women to training. Um, so finally, there are recommendations in the report, and they're split up between kind of recommendations for third parties, for ES providers themselves, for coffee industry and cocoa industry allies and brands who want to work and support gender equity. And then at the end, there is a um, additional information about what is PGE's you know, next step and commitment as a result of this research. 
um, what what do they still need to know? Uh, what what does the industry in co coffee and cocoa industry still need to know? And how will PGE contribute to uh, supporting that research to, to find that out and continue to work with uh, with both industries to increase and improve gender equity? So um, yeah, so that's that's all for me. But yes, please don't stop there and definitely uh, read read on in the report. There's a lot of great information and more information that we didn't get to today. So this is your teaser, but I'll turn it back to Kimberly or Greg to introduce Pam. Hi, thanks, Nora. <clears throat> Thank um, yeah, the you know one of the uh, just to talk a little bit more about the research bef before we go into this aspect of it is um, uh, I've. Uh, over the over the last year, um, I've, I've been reading an enormous amount of research uh, on the subject of gender equity, and and one of the things that I that I was really impressed that the Yale students did um, in writing this report was making it a very reader friendly uh, read. It's 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 relatively short. It's very succinct. It's in plain language. Um, and it really does call out various uh, supply chain actors, uh, specifically uh, uh, talking about um, uh, what might your role be in moving gender forward. And, and I think that's, that's one of the highlights of the gender equity uh, uh, index uh, as that initiative. So um, one of the things that we've, um, that I wanna make perfectly clear is that the gender equity index, this diagnostic tool that Kimberly uh, uh, mentioned at the top um, is a tool that we are currently developing. So it doesn't exist yet. Uh, the development started in February. We brought together that industry group of uh, phase one uh, developers to, to help us in that process. And, um, and we're right on track, uh, happy to report. Um, we've got uh, uh, questions uh, in, in their final phase. We're, we're waiting answers at this point and, and uh, uh, drafting recommendations uh, that come from the gender equity index. So, so that'll be, uh, so that, that project is on track and, and moving forward. And, and Pam um, from Ecom is, is one of the EAS service providers um, that this uh, tool is designed to help. Um, and, and the, it, you know, the research itself was super important to us in terms of you know, we are trying to engage the broader industry in, um, in, in ensuring that everybody's on a credible gender equity journey. Um, as we move into gender equity as a topic, uh, the industry has, is, relies upon third party uh, gender experts to, to bring capacity to their organizations. And this is really an attempt to take that to the next step and, and to demonstrate that, you know, you, you may be an agronomist who, who understands how to diagnose uh, a plant disease uh, 15 ways, um, but you also have a role to play as an agronomist in ensuring that, that you understand the, the impacts of gender on your effectiveness as a trainer. So it's really about, you know, harnessing this, this, this huge investment that we're all making um, uh, and making sure that that investment uh, uh, pays uh, uh, dividends to women equally uh, as it does to men. So with that, Pam, thank you very much uh, for, for joining us uh, today. And, and really um, just interested in, in hearing your thoughts and comments um, uh, about Ecom. Uh, Ecom has over uh, 1,500 uh, agronomists uh, on the ground providing technical support uh, to uh, to farmers, but that's actually represents somewhat a, a, a smaller slice of the total sustainability footprint that that you have. Uh, uh, the agronomists are are sort of the 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 point of the spear, so to speak. But there's an enormous amount of program design, monitoring, data collection, analysis uh, that, that even encompasses a greater um, ecosystem at Ecom. So uh, perhaps you could uh, talk a little bit about why Ecom is involved in this and, 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 um, and, and, and what you took away from both the uh, research, um, but also um, how that research is, is uh, how you're seeing that play out in the gender equity index development itself. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, 
the research really resonated with us because we we recognize that we're inconsistent in including or prioritizing gender. So, I mean, we have programs in, in all the origin countries we work with. And, and sometimes while we do have a lot of participation da data that's disaggregated, um, we don't necessarily use that data to inform program design in the future, unless it's something very specific in the context of a donor funded program that requires that or you know, something like specialty coffee only focusing on women or something like that. But we have this interest in, in kind of embedding gender as a priority across all our sustainability programs and as part of kind of our core um, commitments you know, to, to sustainability because we see the importance of it, but we don't know how necessarily because you know, we're experts at, at working at, on productivity and, and farming itself. As you said, we have you know, a thousand, more than a thousand agronomists in the field and you know, we work with lead farmers and, and farmers and, but we need to kind of see how we can help our own staff to recognize their, their role, as you say. And, and just, it's not necessarily that they don't want to, it's just that maybe they're not aware of it. So we saw the index as a way to kind of highlight our deficiencies, but also see where we do have points of strengths and how can we more intentionally share that experience across all our programs and all our origins to kind of get better at this and then also engage external experts where we need to but be more um be better at asking for help because we know we have a better context of what exactly is it that we need where where are we deficient or where could we use the support what would be the roadmap to get better and how who would be the best resource to help us get there so we really saw the index as a way to, you know, create a starting point. This is where we are. And then how could we build off that a roadmap to show continuous improvement over time and make it more actionable rather than just saying, you know, we're, we know we're bad at this. <laughs> Someone help us, but be more specific and more intentional in how we ask for help and, and where, where it could come from. Um. You know, one of the um, uh, things that I've that I've noticed, uh, just in terms of evaluating sustainability programs in general, is that it is that when you're increasing the skills of farmers, um, that it's very difficult to understand what was the specific impact of my skill building program on mm -hmm. this farmer's well being. Um, on this farmer's ability to farm profitably and economically, environmentally sustainable. Um, and, and because those impacts very often take place over years and are, are somewhat difficult to uh, pull out of, of, you know, like what impact did the gender work have versus, you know, the impact of, of any number of other variables that might impact. Yeah, even external crop. variables like climate or something like that, that we don't necessarily have control over, but could show kind of a spike in, in whatever, whatever our long-term kind of ambition is that could help us along the way or hurt us, you know. Exactly. And, and so one of the, one of the benefits of this is that that organizations need to be able to report on two things. They need to be able to report on the impact of their programs for sure. And that's going to be a continuous area of development for organizations. But how does an organization like Ecom begin to communicate their progress on gender equity in other ways? And, and so being able to have that narrative, being able to have that story about here's where we are, and this is what we discovered. And here's how we prioritized our activities based on the deficiencies that we found. And here's the progress we've made on, on improving those deficiencies. And here's some uh, narrative and, and qualitative information uh, that demonstrate what we've done as an organization. So you can begin to see there's two kinds of reporting here, a reporting that is focused on what was the impact to women, but what was, there's another uh, uh, scope of reporting, which was as an organization, how have we transformed? How have we changed? And what is our plan for continuous improvement on that change? Mm -hmm. At PGE, 
we're really laser focused on that aspect of it. Um, that we're at the very beginning stages of gender equity development broadly in the industry. And so the spotlight really needs to be on our collective capacity to move gender equity forward um, as we develop those um, uh, as we develop those uh, measures for actual impact on women's well-being and empowerment. But I'm wondering from your perspective, just you you have a lot of customer interaction. Um, do how do you envision actually being able to talk about gender equity perhaps in a different way? as the result of the gender equity index or, or a greater understanding of, of gender equity um, uh, capacity building within e-com itself? I mean, we hope that the index will give us kind of a, a common language. So to talk about, you know, all of our different programs, which may vary in terms of how they engage in, in gender equity activities, but it would give us that kind of that language around it to be able to express ourselves better to our clients to you know this is is what we're doing and this is how we're progressing kind of at a global level versus an individual origin or program level that might be related directly to something that they're financing um and bring in kind of examples of of things that we could do to strengthen it um but having that ability to communicate and kind of compare what are now kind of apples to oranges, <laughs> compare them within the same structure of a diagnostic tool will help us a lot in, in improving our communication and um, also just with our program design internally. So a lot of times, you know, we work with roasters or chocolate brands to design programs on the ground and gender is kind of an add-on, but if we have this language and can see how it, we can incorporate it more, um, in, integrated into each aspect of the program rather than its own kind of separate component. Um, I think that will be very helpful in, in kind of in our transformation of, of making it something more embedded in what we do. Um, but definitely the, the kind of creation of this common language and kind of having a, a broader view of, of where we are is, we see that as is something that we'll get out of the index and we're excited to to work with. One of the, one of the findings that, that uh, did come from the research as well was, was that um, this process of gender analysis, which is really that boots on the ground uh, discovery of, of who the audience is. Um, mm -hmm. Who are these women? What functions are they playing on the farm? Um, what do they view as helpful? Um, what is their availability for training? Uh, what are the potential barriers for them to obtain this training, but not only obtain it, but to utilize it and to benefit from it. Um, and, and so uh, this, from, from a gender analysis point of view, um, how, how do you feel that, that gender analysis is, is currently being utilized amongst sustainability service providers uh, broadly? I think it's it's definitely something that's lacking. So you you do see it in in some cases, um, and looking at kind of bigger issues like land tenure and things like that. Um, but in each specific program, it's not necessarily happening on a smaller scale to kind of figure out the best way. And part of it is, I think, just I mean, for example, if we talk about kind of a certification program. The way certification works for, for a lot of different reasons is that one person on the farm is the certified farmer. So then that becomes your target audience. And for, in many cultures, that person is usually the male. So then when you're talking about your certified population, you're looking at the male, not necessarily the family on the farm. So you kind of have to change that lens a bit to, to be able to integrate more women and, and um, you know, not and change our, our target to be everyone who provides or is working on the farm in whatever capacity they are working rather than kind of we're targeting, you know, 1000 certified farmers, you're targeting 1000 certified farming households um, and how, how best to do that. But uh, yeah, the gender analysis part is not necessarily happening now and would definitely be helpful um, to kind of 
transition and, and that change that lens a bit so we can better approach the households rather than the certified farmer. Well, thanks, Pam. Really appreciate your input there and, and the insights that you're providing. Um, you know, one of the one of the results of the research and the gender equity index for uh, partnership for gender equity is that we're really looking internally at our role as as really being a facilitator of capacity building for organizations uh, like ecom that are on this journey and that, that are on their own gender equity journey. So that's that's a key um, organizational development piece for us where we're beginning to see our role as an, an arbiter, a connector of uh, gender equity capacity building um, and matching that to the specific needs of uh, various uh, service providers. So, so again, you can begin to see how the gender equity index tool, this research um, and, and, and this initiative which is really designed to, to, to give everybody uh, the, the, uh, the tools, the, the, the ever improving tools of, of gender equity and, and gender equity awareness that, uh, that is uh, so necessary to, to really move the needle on this on, on, a, on a global way. So appreciate, uh, appreciate you, Pam, taking some time this morning and, and, and definitely for, for Ecom's participation in this uh, event. Great, yeah, no, we're happy to uh, be here because we, we would really like to improve. So we see this as a way to help us get there. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Greg. And thank you so much, Pam, uh, not only for participating today, but for all of the valuable input that you and your team have given into the tool uh, and our process. So it's key to have, make sure that this work is informed by the right industry, insight and also the gender and development expertise that exists. Uh, so we're not reinventing the wheel, but really bringing together the best uh, wisdom that we have from a, from a wide variety of supporters. So thanks so much. So I um, want to move in to tell you a little bit about what's, what's next. Uh, with the research and also with the Gender Equity Index. So uh, again, thanks to all of you for joining today. And Nora did a great job teasing you in terms of uh, what, the, what are the findings and what is uh, what you'll find in the report. So we will be sending out that report to all of you. Uh, we're gonna, we're actually doing a few design tweaks between now uh, and over the weekend. So you'll get it on Monday. And um, we will put up this recording of the webinar on our YouTube channel. So both of those um, will be available to you early next week. The study will be published um, and put on the website of UNITAR and made broadly available uh, starting next month. And we will be continuing with uh, research funded by Women Forward International and supported by, by UNITAR and again, another team from, from Yale uh, into the fall and potentially the spring as well. So some of the recommendations for research that are in the, in the study are being considered for uh, further, further research. So um, that's where we are next steps with the research. And then with the gender gender equity index, uh, our our phase one is uh, as much as you can conclude. Uh, we're we're moving on from phase one into phase two, starting in August and early in the fall. And what we'll be doing is taking the tool and um, working with uh, service providers like Ecom and others to help also validate the tool and make sure that it's fit regionally, fit for purpose, uh, recognizing that there are, there was a question that came up in our Q&A, so thanks for that, um, that we wanna make sure that this tool really does work both across coffee and cocoa and in the wide variety of geographic regions and the issues that are, um, um, in, that are, that are culturally, um, linked in those, in those different areas. So we really are looking at not only uh, ensuring that services reach women, that would be priority one, uh, and don't uh, unintentionally exacerbate gender inequalities, but really benefit women and ultimately empower women. And this, again, this underscores the, the reality that this is a journey. Gender equity is not something you just flip a switch on and okay, great, yay, we're finally gender equitable. Uh, it really is a, a journey and uh, we're excited to have Ecom and all of our other phase one partners on the journey and uh, invite all of you to join us as well. 
So in terms of what's next, we will be going to um, Expo. Uh, we recognize it's going to be a much uh, smaller event this year, but we do want to bring together industry allies on the day before Expo. We'll have a half day session and we'll be um, inviting some of our partners to share some of the highlights from their work and new perspectives that they're gaining and uh, then also share with uh, the industry too some of the things that, that we're seeing and opportunities to further engage with the work. We have a live session in July with the Coffee Roasters Guild, so we're very excited about that. So stay tuned if you're uh, not on our newsletter or our um, social media, we encourage you to uh, follow us there. And then the virtual learning journey, we have had a couple of webinars about our virtual learning journeys, which are targeted for farmer organizations, both in coffee and cocoa. And if you're, especially if you're a coffee roaster, uh, we do have a program uh, July 20th and July 22nd, where you'll get to hear uh, from a number of the participants in our current virtual learning journey, which is funded by Dunkin' Donuts. And then we are opening up uh, spaces for virtual learning journeys in both English and in Spanish in the fall. So we're looking for uh, 20 to 25 farmer organizations in Spanish. Uh, cocoa or coffee, and uh, 20 to 25 pharma organizations in English, again, either coffee or cocoa for our new sessions of the virtual learning journey that are opening up. And uh, all of this work is really focused on the hidden workforce behind coffee and cocoa. Uh, we recognize that women have been for, for decades and generations playing a critical role in, uh, in the coffee and cocoa supply chains and their work really has been hidden. So we're eager to continue to spread uh, the word and shine the spotlight on this, this critical uh, role and help to ensure that, that women's, women are uh, benefiting from the, the work in the sector. And our goal as the, uh, the Partnership for Gender Equity is really to be able to, you know, with all of you on this journey towards greater gender equity to say something, stand up in front of the, the United Nations to really declare progress made on, on SDG 5. Um, we recognize that this work is critical in terms of not only the impact that we can have in coffee and cocoa, but also potentially a demonstration effect for other agricultural supply chains. Um, so we invite you to uh, advocate for this, this uh, gender equity journey in coffee and, and cocoa. Uh, if you are a roaster or a brand, for example, you can request that your, uh, your supply chain partners are engaged with the GEI, taking the diagnostic tool and um, encouraging uh, their work and also considering what could be your own gender equity journey. And it really is, it really is about this journey and collaboration and um, that all of us have a role to play. And we're excited for what the future holds for us. Uh, we know that the situation with COVID is heartbreaking in many parts of the world where all of us have allies and friendships. And uh, we cannot risk that gender equity, the progress that we've made on gender equity to date backslides because of COVID. And so um, we invite you to work with us to step up and continue on this journey, supporting our partners along the supply chain and really creating a more gender equitable future for, for everyone in the coffee and cocoa sectors and beyond. So with that, uh, just to thank you all for your time today. Thanks again to Pam for joining us and sharing her experience and to Nora for sharing the findings and the Yale students uh, and all of the terrific work that, that they've done. Uh, Greg and our, our funding supporters, both the, um, the phase one supporters of the GEI as well as Women Forward International and UNITAR and, and Yale. So again, you'll be receiving the um, research study uh, so you can read it yourself on Monday and uh, this link will be available to the webinar so you can share it around and help us to spread the word. With that, thanks so much and have a great, uh, great weekend. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Bye. Bye. Uh, thanks.